and there is the notice. Just had to make sure I had the right settings up. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I am Alicia Lane Outlaw. I'm the Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Commission for the Deaf, Deafblind, and Hard of Hearing. I'll give you a visual description of myself. I'm a white Hispanic woman with dark wavy hair down to my shoulders, and I'm wearing a black sweater, and I'm sitting in front of a black background. My role today is as the moderator. I'm here to facilitate our dialogue with Representative Jamie Becker Finn and to talk about her bill. Before we begin, I'd like to ask Jessalyn, who is our Civics Engagement Director, to just explain some of the technical aspects of today's informational session. Jessalyn? Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jessalyn Ackerman Frank, and I'm serving as tech support with you all this evening. For my visual appearance, I am a white woman with blonde hair mixed with brown as well, and it's pulled back. And I'm wearing a black shirt and jacket, as well as having a black backdrop. Here are some tips for a smooth session today. If you would like to ask Representative Becker Finn a question on video, please go ahead and raise your hand using the, at the bottom of the screen, the reactions tab. If you select that, you have the option to raise your hand. And once you have raised your hand, then you would wait for the moderator to call on you and we'll spotlight your video so that you can go ahead and sign your question. And if you don't want to be on video, then you can go ahead and type your question within the chat. And everybody will be able to see that question that's typed in the chat. If you raise your hand and we call on you and bring your video up, you would be signing your question yourself. All right, I'm gonna turn it back now to Alicia. Great, thank you, Jessalyn. Thank you, Jessalyn. I'd like to start with a brief overview of the bill. And then I'll show you how to investigate the bill further on your own, how to do some more research. The goal's main bill is to modify Minnesota's current educational law. The current requirement to include certified interpreters. As of now, currently written, even fully certified deaf interpreters are excluded from being considered educational interpreters in the eyes of the state of Minnesota. This bill also categorizes all educational interpreters as essential personnel. So I'm going to ask Jessalyn to share a link in the, oh, she just did, great. If you click on that link, it will lead to the home page for the bill. You can see who the authors are, the current status of the bill, and the language of the bill. In just a moment, I'm going to share my screen with you and just give you a quick basic Bill 101 class. 
For accessibility purposes, while I'm sharing my screen, I will continue to sign what I'm doing. And that's so that the interpreter can continue to audio describe essentially what's going on so that people listening to the audio can follow along. Otherwise, if you are able to see what's happening on the screen, you don't need to watch me signing. Once I've described everything, then I will stop sharing my screen and come back on. So give me just a moment to get set up here. So I've just pulled up the bill's homepage. If you look on the left-hand side, and I'm currently circling it with a marker, you can see the lead authors are Becker Finn, Representative Daniels, and Representative Moeller. Becker Finn being the lead author is listed first. If I click on Becker Finn's name, it's a link, and then it takes you to an informational page that describes who Becker Finn is. Now, let me go back to the page I was just on. Actually, hang on just a second. The Zoom controls are blocking what I can see on my screen. Sorry. Give me a moment to figure this out. OK, so now I'm back on the bill's main homepage. Now, if you want to see the exact bill of the language of the bill, you will click on the link that says as introduced. I'm going to click on that link. And then that brings up the actual text of the bill. You don't need to read all of it right now. In fact, the, the underlined information, I just circled that on the screen, is added information. Information that was added to the bill after it was introduced, rather. And I just highlighted a word that was stricken. So you'll see the word, and it's got a line going right through it. So that's language that has been stricken from the text. And now I will go back to the page we were on just a minute ago. And we're back to the home page. And now finally, You see the section titled Actions. That's a chronological listing of the different things that have happened to the bill. And you see that I just circled March 8th, 2021. 
that's a committee report to adopt and re-refer to the Education Finance Committee. I'll stop sharing my screen now. I hope everybody was able to follow that. So that allows you to see what's happening with the bill and with the bill's language. And with the bill's language, it's not always completely up to date. For example, last Thursday, the Educational Finance Committee had a meeting and you will notice that the last action that was listed was in March 8th of 2021, that it was to be re-referred to the Finance Committee. So from March 8th till just this past Thursday, nothing had happened, but then they had a meeting. And there was a small amendment added, which hasn't been updated on the legislative systems website yet, but it will be shortly. I don't know exactly when that will happen, but it won't be too long. So anytime you're looking at the web page, if you're not sure if something's been updated, feel free to reach out to me and ask because I can do a little more research on that if I don't already have the answer. Okay. So now that you've learned how to find the bill's lead author, I would like to talk a little bit about the lead author for the CDI bill. We're quite excited to have Representative Jamie Becker Finn with us here this evening. She's been serving as a legislature since 2016. She owns a small business and she's an attorney who teaches at the Hamlin Mitchell School, Mitchell Hamlin, excuse me, School of Law. In her legislative work, one of Representative Becker Finn's top priorities is equitable education in E12, early childhood, through 12 settings. She's been working on this CDI bill for several years to remove barriers for families seeking reasonable accommodations for their children. In 2021, 20 of the bills she led were signed into law by the governor, including the Healthy Start Act, which allowed pregnant inmates to serve their sentences with their babies. We hope the CDI in the classroom bill will be added to her list of bills signed into law this year. Welcome Representative Becker Finn. We are truly appreciative of you taking your time to have this conversation with us in the community. Welcome, are you ready for your first question? Uh, yes, uh, very excited to be with all of you this evening um, talking about this CDI bill that we have been working on for a long time. Um, so I'm excited to share it with other people. Well, great. So I will pull up uh, a question. I will display the text in English and then I will sign it in ASL, and then we'll give you the opportunity to respond. So the first question is, what will the CDI's function be in the classroom? Will they be working standalone or as a team with an interpreter who can hear? And I'll close the screen share and allow you to respond. 
Uh, so the idea with the bill is that uh, they would be able to be working as a team in the classroom, obviously. Uh, so I am not deaf, uh, but I, you know, my understanding is that the only way for this to work is to have them working as a team. And right now, uh, certified deaf interpreters are not recognized in our educational statute. So some school districts are not paying for that team um, because the CDI isn't recognized. And so what the bill does is says specifically that schools um, could reimburse, uh, could receive funding uh, for that purpose so that they could work as a team as needed by the student. Thank you. And before I go any further, I just want to see whether there are any questions from our audience. Uh, Jessalyn, I see you have, there are hands up and I see, Jessalyn, you have your hand up. Jessalyn, would you like to come on screen? And then following Jessalyn, we'll have Reagan. Certainly. The first question that we had from Les is, what are the requirements of a CDI? And let me just expand a little bit. What are the educational requirements for CDIs? Um, so what I can tell you in the bill is that the bill uh, doesn't lay that out. So that would be uh, in the purview of MDE and uh, in the rulemaking process. But the bill just says that they would have to be uh, hold a certified deaf interpreter certification issued by RID. Um, and then there are other options for folks uh, who have completed a training course affiliated with an accredited in educational institution. So that's the definition within the statute. Uh, anything additional would be up to MDE uh, to figure out. Great. Great. Thank you so much. And then Reagan, you had a question. Go ahead and come on screen. Great, wonderful, hello everyone. I do have two items that I wanted to talk about. First, I wanted to clarify, we're talking about deaf interpreters from K through 12. Since 2006, we've been talking about this, but before the first time that actually happened to have a paid individual as a role of a deaf interpreter was in 1999. And it was someone who I would spoke with this morning, actually, I was thrilled to find that out. And that's how I was able to join tonight. So my first question, with deaf interpreters, it wouldn't matter if it's a deaf or a hearing person or a coder or anyone. So my point being that whatever interpreter that would show up needs to be a language specialist, a cultural specialist as well, could be someone from another country. But really, the question is moot, because the important point is that you would have the ability to bring in a deaf interpreter because some not saying that hearing interpreters are not competent, but it would be able to bring more credibility and have more flexibility. Deaf interpreters are able to have more flexibility for within the classroom, in large auditorium settings, in several different settings. And so I'd be thrilled to see that happen. And then second of all, the first time in, that's been published in history uh, was just three months ago. We had a publication about CDIs working in K through 12 settings. And really there are several different settings where deaf interpreters could be utilized. It's not only limited to classroom settings. And so I'm not seeing how certified deaf interpreters could be incorporated in other settings that are not just the classroom in K through 12 setting. So we know that uh, we don't want to limit the role of certified deaf, interpret certified deaf interpreters. And it doesn't matter if we're liberal or conservative, et cetera. I'm just thrilled to see that this could be the first in statute in history. So hopefully others will follow. 
Minnesota's example. And before, yeah, this you, is before you respond, Representative uh, Becker Finn, I just want to say um, to Regan, uh, if you want to reach out to me uh, with that information that you had, the best practices for uh, working in deaf hearing teams, uh, I can pass that along to uh, the Minnesota Department of Education, who I'm sure would be interested to see that, and we could you can use that document for rulemaking at a later point. So that would Absolutely. be great. And I'd be happy also, to. And you also mentioned here several times. Where are you? Where is your here? Here is in Maine. I'm in Richmond Hill. Working with Judy Shepard Cagle, I see you're Working saying. Working with Judy Shepard Cagle. Mm -hmm. And they hired me and they seem to like it. And I'm I'm a certified deaf interpreter. And so that was the first time that they had formally hired someone. And it was from, I don't know if it from her statements, but uh, that's how I was able to reach out and join this evening was because of Judy, so. Great. Representative Becker-Finn, would you like to respond? Uh, yeah, and I, I think it might be helpful to share a little bit of background about how this bill came about. Uh, so specifically, the reason this bill is focused on uh, K through 12, E through 12 schools is that this bill was brought to me. I have a constituent. Um, he's now a teenager, uh, a student, and uh, he is deaf and his parents are deaf. And uh, they came to me because their school district was refusing to provide a CDI uh, for him. And when he was younger and in the lower grades in school, he didn't really need a CDI, but as his schooling and his education and his materials became more complex, he really needed um, the additional level of communication that comes with a CDI. And some school districts have been figuring out ways to make this work, but some of them aren't. And the attorney from that school district had said that they thought they couldn't be reimbursed uh, if they were to provide a CDI because a CDI isn't set out in our state statute. And so um, they brought this bill forward, this issue forward to me. I tried to help them work with the school district and it's much easier often to deal with an individual situation than changing a law. But what we realized is that the law really did need to change. Um, I will also add that part of the reason I was able to understand what uh, this student's needs were is because I previously clerked in district court and there was a family that had a case before us where the parents were deaf and I had experience working with a CDI team um, in a courtroom setting. And so I was already familiar with this idea that certified deaf interpreters existed and that they were different than just an ASL interpreter. Uh, so I think that background sort of helpful and why this bill is focused the way that it is uh, and is specifically targeted at students. And I do have a follow-up question, if you wouldn't mind. Do they allow teams of two in each of the classrooms? Because in New York, where I've consulted several for several years now, they only allow one interpreter in the classroom. And so then that would become a challenge. So then even if it was, even hearing interpreters weren't able to team. And so in that case, just as a single deaf interpreter, that doesn't function well. And so how, would the interpreters be able to work all day would be to have two. And I'm just curious, does Minnesota allow two interpreters per class? Uh, so in Minnesota, the currently the statute is silent to that. Um, I will say, you know, the legislative intent for oh. the bill is that mm -hmm. uh, whatever is in that child's individual plan for what is gonna work best for them, we're making it possible that if what's decided is what's best for them and what will help them uh, do the best in school is to have a team with a CDI, then that would be the case. Although you do bring up a good point as this, this bill has gotten more attention, other people have asked that question. And you know it may be something that we would add a line uh, into the bill to state 
specifically okay. that the intention would be that two interpreters would be allowed in cases where it was necessary um, for the student to get the services they need. At least two, because of budgeting, that then legislature could make some budgetary adjustments. Here, the services are not really great, um, so that they had to make some changes to prevent that they actually made it more proactive approach so that really, I think this is wonderful ch for children in K through 12 settings. And so instead of having reactive services um, as our legislature did, then certainly it would be better to be proactive. Yes, thank you, Regan. Appreciate that. And before we go on to the other um, hands, I want to respond to the questions that we have already in our queue, and then we'll move to the questions from the audience. So our second question. Is. Does this does does this bill apply only to the K twelve setting, or does it include post secondary settings? Uh, so this this bill specifically uh, applies just to to a K twelve setting. Um, our statutes in Minnesota are in totally different sections of statute, and again, you know, this came from uh, a, a student who was in K twelve. Uh, who needed this assistance. I, I will say also, um, as an attorney, I think that uh, this really is a right of folks to access these interpreters. And um, part of the reason I wanted to do this bill is that we shouldn't have to rely on people, you know, potentially suing their school district or suing their uh you know, their college or university to get the services that really should be uh, provided to them. So I think that's another element to this. I would hope that as we bring this forward and uh, really lay this out in, in the public and, and lift up this conversation about the need for CDIs, that uh, there may be more uh, colleges and universities who may proactively figure out ways uh, to provide these services, uh, even if they're not included in this bill. Thank you, Representative Becker Phil Finn, excuse me. Anna, we, I see you have a question. Uh, if you want to turn on your video, we can spotlight you and then you can ask your question. Hang on, Gloria, hang on just a moment. Jessalyn, can we spotlight Gloria, please? You see Gloria, she's listed as Anna. Can you spotlight her? Okay, Gloria, you're spotlit. Go ahead. Well, I was actually raising my hand to respond to a different, uh, to a previous question. And hello, Representative Becker Finn, it's great to see you. Regan, also thank you for your comments and questions. And so Les, you had a question about what are the educational requirements for getting a CDI? And so I wanted to respond to that. To become a certified deaf interpreter, you do have to have a bachelor's degree and you have to complete 40 hours of interpreter training and then take a written test. And it's not actually a written English. It's an English test with, with question and answer. It's a knowledge test. Pass that and then you would take a performance assessment. It's the performance test. Once you have completed all of those requirements, then you could actually become a certified deaf interpreter. Those are the actual educational 
and other requirements. And so that's, I wanted to respond to Les with that. And- um, hey, Regan, Regan, hang on, Regan. Regan, no, to... we see you. Let's go Can to I... Les first. Uh, and then we'll go to Regan to add to Gloria's comments. Les? All right, hello, my name is Les Fairbanks. And some of you are already familiar with me. I was waiting. I am on the board for the Minnesota Commission for Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. I live in the White Earth Reservation. I am Native American. And I do have a few questions. And I am the Minnesota Commission so did vote to support this. And I did not actually support this myself because I didn't feel I had enough information. And so that's the reason why I joined this, e this evening so I could have my other questions satisfied. I do have a few questions. And as I'm looking at it, having two people in the classroom, I'm wondering about the cost benefit ratio. You know, we do have the state school for the deaf, and then we have also the um, metro school for the deaf. And you know that the um, state academies for the deaf, I'm just wondering in comparison, what are the cost benefit ratios? You know, I personally live five hours north of St. Paul, and really, I don't think I've seen a CDI that far north. Uh, it's a very small school district, so that's one consideration. And I'm, so I'm wondering about other alternatives to having a CDI interpreter in the classroom. Uh, I myself have gone through quite some time ago the experience of um, having a different a greater approach as a deaf individual. I am completely deaf and I did have an experience with the CDI myself and it wasn't a great experience. So I am very skeptical. I'm very dubious. about CDIs in the classroom as a working interpreter because of being, having a deaf child in the K through 12 setting. Les, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanna clarify what your question is. So I understand your perspective, but what are you asking? In greater Minnesota, I'm not sure if there's a benefit What would be the good of this bill in greater Minnesota? So you're asking about the cost benefit analysis of providing a CDI in greater Minnesota, is that correct? As well as in the metro area. Okay. Because, you know, we do have the two schools. We do have Metro Deaf School right here. Okay, let's let... Uh, Representative becker Finn respond to that question. Yeah, I think uh, all, all good questions and I'm, I'm happy to take them one at a time. It's hard to take notes to try to respond to everything that's been said. Um, I think the important thing is that um, we don't want to set up a system where a student who's deaf, that their only option is to attend the Metro Deaf School or the Academy. 
Uh, it should be up to that student and their family. There are lots of reasons why you might want to continue to attend school in your home school district. Uh, you know, friends and access to activities and being close to home. Um, maybe you have siblings who are in that school district. And the important thing to me is that this really is a right that every student should have. And we shouldn't force a student to only have a few options of which school they attend just because they're deaf. And so in the case of the constituent that I was helping, um, this student wanted to be in the mainstream school district with his classmates and in his home community. That was a choice that was important to him. And I think, um, as I think about, uh, you know, what his plans are in the future as he becomes a young adult and what he's going to do as an adult. Um, you know, I think that's wanting to be part of that mainstream community is some is a choice that his family wanted to make. And I think that's really important as well as just recognizing sort of the um, individual power that a person has to make choices about their own life. And in this case, uh, that was the choice that that this student and his family made. And I, um, I really believe strongly that, you know, no matter what the, um, I don't even like to always use the word disability, but the different abilities of any child or any student, that they can choose what's best for them. And so the idea here, and I do, I want to make sure folks understand this, we're not forcing anyone to use a CDI if it's not the best fit for them. What this does is for students where that is the best fit, because we know because this, this particular student didn't have access to a CDI and it wasn't working. Um, when he had access to a CDI, he did much better in school. And when he didn't, it, then things started to fall off for him academically. Um, and to be honest, you know, there are times when I've talked to the family and uh, they've been really down about the whole thing because uh, it felt like he just wasn't able to thrive because he didn't have access to the CDI. So I think um, the idea is for every individual child that they, the family and the school can work together to make sure that we're giving each child the tools they need to thrive. And for some kids, that's gonna be a, a CDI team and for others, it's not. And so I think, you know, sort of this question about the cost benefit, I, I think the um, your human right and your right to an education where you want to go to school in your home community, I don't, it's hard to put a price on what that means um, for a student and a family and their mental health, um, all those kinds of things. I think it's hard to really cost benefit analysis that. Um, as to the, the rural Minnesota, part of the problem because we haven't been recognizing CDIs is that there aren't very many of them. Um, and so if we recognize them and it becomes a tool that becomes available to students in schools, hopefully we would have more of them. Uh, I also think with, uh, with us all being used to using Zoom now, there may be ways to use a CDI and um, work with a team no matter where you're located. Uh, whether you're in a, a classroom or uh, or remote, uh, you know, I, I know that that's the family that I worked with. There were times that the only interpreter that he was able to work with was over a video conferencing platform and it was somebody in a different state because that's who was available and um, who had the ability to provide uh, the level of uh, translation that that child needed. So I hope that answers your questions. I think that this uh, this bill can benefit anyone in the state. It's not specific to any one region. Thank you, Representative Becker. Oh, Les, did you have something else that you wanted to ask? Or did you need to clarify oh, something? I did want to add, I'm wondering about adding to the bill. And so then the one change to that is making it so that it's not mandatory to have a CDI, but it would depend on the competencies of the deaf child and what's required or not 
So it's not being forced on deaf children. That's what I wanted to ensure. I just wanna be sure that we're able to protect everyone, school districts, parents, as well as the children. That was all, thank you. Representative. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. This isn't forcing anything on anyone. It's providing another option if this is the option that works best for that student and that family at where they are in their schooling. So this wouldn't change anything about anybody else's current access to the interpreters who work well for them. Thank you. Uh, let's bring up the next question. Uh, Regan's hand has gone down. So we'll move to the next question. How many CDIs are there in Minnesota? And we sort of have answered that a little bit in the last, last question, but Representative Becker Finn? Um, I'm trying to find my notes um, and uh, Alicia, you may have them more ready than I do. Um, but I mean, the short do, answer is yes. there yeah. aren't that many. Um, and partially it's because schools haven't yeah. been able to reimburse for them. Would you say that again, Representative Beckerfin? Uh, we were overlapping each other. So if you could give your answer one more time, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, no problem. And sorry, I was looking at my other screen, so I couldn't tell that you were talking at the same time. Uh, so the the short answer is that there aren't that many. And partially that's because, uh, you know, as was referenced in one of the previous questions, um, we are just starting to break through with any legal recognition of certified deaf interpreters. And my hope is that with a bill like this and having conversations like this, um, people will start to understand better because the reality is that most folks outside of the deaf community do not know what a certified deaf interpreter is and just assume it's a fancy way of referring to an ASL interpreter. And um, I think that's one of the reasons it's taken so long for us to move this bill forward. It's relatively simple as a bill but it's taken this long for me to explain and convince to my colleagues why it's important and why it's different um, than what they might already assume about what interpreters are and what they do. Thank you, Representative Beckerfin. Okay. And now I see Regan has raised her hand again. So we'll ask Regan to be spotlit. And Regan, if you could wait until you're spotlit, great. Hello again, everyone. I just did want to let Les know, I, I'm hoping Les is still watching and that I am actually from Abenaki in Maine and it's Wabanaki Nation, it's one of the four tribes. And so I'm from that. I'm also one fourth Native American myself. And I understand your, your frustration concerns. In 2003, I did challenge RID to raise some of the requirements for hearing interpreters. I was there and there were some Native American individuals who were very upset and I realized that we didn't communicate well with them first. And so people are talking about what's the benefit of a CDI and having had horrible experiences. Now at that time, the deaf interpreter standards were not yet raised. And so now there is more careful screening regarding uh, qualified interpreters for K through 12 as well. So, we do want to ensure that deaf children, including Native American deaf children, are not suffering by having interpreters who are not qualified. We certainly want those interpreters that are not qualified 
to no longer be working with people. And I'm very sorry that you did have a negative experience with CDI. So I did just want to recognize that. And I also wanted to clarify that as Gloria had said that 40 hours of interpreter uh, training is no longer required. That was dropped because Castly has now said due to feedback has said, no, that's not required anymore. And so we do have to be mindful though, that some people who are upset and mad just really about this, certainly CDIs can now take more educational opportunities. And so for teaching in general, we do have, we, we do wanna ensure that deaf children in K through 12 settings are getting their best services. And so for CDIs that want to get into K through 12 settings, they do need to be working alongside teachers as well and not just providing services that aren't qualified. And so that's all. It's become like the honor system. And now that 40 hours is no longer required, but it's still kind of the honor system, just to clarify about that. And so this new test, we are going to be having hearing and deaf interpreters taking the same knowledge test, but that 40 hours is no longer required, just to clarify. Great, thank you, Regan. I just want to let um, people know in the audience who may be unaware what CASLI is, it's an organization that has developed and is in the process of finalizing the new test for interpreters? Well, the written portion is ready, but the oh, performance correct. is still being finalized. Correct, the performance, uh, performance test is in process. Um, so there's been a moratorium for the past five or so year, actually more than five years um, uh, with credentialing deaf interpreters. And we're hoping that that's going to be starting soon because of the small numbers that many deaf interpreters, many aspiring deaf interpreters can't become certified at this point. So um, let's see, where are we? And I do see another question. Oh, okay. Um, so we have a system for people in the chat really quickly. I'm just going to bring up the next question in our queue. And I don't see any hands currently raised. So yeah, let me bring up the next question. So what information do you have on CDI licensing? I'll stop sharing. Representative Becker Finn. Yeah, well, I th feel, feel like we just uh, uh, addressed that a little bit, um, but I'm not sure. I know Gloria has some background in this as well, so she may want to share uh, her perspective. Um, Alicia, I know you have a background as well with the rulemaking process and and that side of things as well. Um, I was I mistyped in the chat. I was going to say, please uh, feel free to reach out to me if there are other related issues to this bill that others need help with um, related to things we might be able to do as a legislature. I'm happy to work on things uh, in the future as well, in addition to this bill. And I just wanna make sure that uh, folks know they are welcome to reach out to me directly after this meeting if there are ways that I can help. So I will, uh, I will put my email address in the chat uh, for people to reach out. Um, regarding issues I might I'm probably not aware of like I said um, I'm not deaf and I don't have a deaf family member I um, am learning and uh, supportive of the community and uh, want to be as helpful as I can even if you're not a constituent of mine so I will put that uh, in the in the chat Thank you, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, Jesslyn, I see your hand raised if you'd like to come on screen.
There is a question in the chat that says, could a family insist on a CDI being hired for early childhood kindergarten instead of a non-certified interpreter? And could they insist you know, on the district hiring the CDI instead of changing their job title from an interpreter to a language facilitator in order to keep a hearing interpreter who could not pass the certification test. This is a big issue in outstate Minnesota. Representative Beckerfin. I, so I, I mean, that's the first I've heard of that issue. So I'm not sure that this bill would really address uh, the second part of your problem as far as, uh, you know, changing the job title. I, I know in the process I've gone through with my own child uh, who needed an IEP, you know, there's a whole process that you go through in determining what tools and what uh, supports your individual child would need. Um, so, I mean, if your child needs a CDI uh, right now, the school district can say, you know, we're really sorry. Uh, you might think that your kid needs a CDI, but we don't have any way in statute that we feel comfortable with that we can reimburse, uh, get, get funding um, to pay for that CDI. And so if this bill, when uh, this bill becomes law, that would be an option for a family in, in kindergarten in our, you know, E through 12 uh, education system. But to the other issue, as far as how a school may be changing the job title, that seems like uh, a separate problem, but um, maybe the kind of thing to reach out to me via email uh, to discuss uh, the issue and if there's a legislative fix needed. Great, thank you. I don't see any hands raised currently, so we'll go to the next question in the queue. Some kids in the mainstream setting used, use manually coded English instead of ASL. How would this bill affect them? Uh, so this bill would just give them the option if a CDI was something that they felt like they needed. Um, this just provides another option. If uh, the, the current system that a student is using is working for them, this wouldn't make it, this wouldn't change anything for them. It would just provide an additional option. Something that just came to me with the most recent question about um, licensing. Uh, I just want to make sure that there's uh, an understanding in the audience of the difference between uh, certification and licensure, because currently Minnesota has no licensure law for interpreters in other than in the K-12 setting. <clears throat> um, and that's something that the commission is also working on, but that's a separate issue from this bill. This bill is focusing um, specifically on who is considered an educational interpreter under state statute and therefore who would be qualified uh, for reimbursement at the district level in the special education system. So I just wanna make sure that that's understood that it's a different focus. Uh, I see that we have a few minutes remaining and um, Regan, I see your hand is up again. I, uh, I wanna let Representative Becker Finn respond to the next question, which I believe should be fairly short and then We'll go to Regan. So the question is, the Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf Students who are mainstreamed in the Faribault Public School System, for some classes, those students have greater exposure to ASL due to living in the dorms at the academy. Do you anticipate CDIs being used in those student for those students in those situations? Uh, so again, this bill uh, only applies in the E through 12 setting. 
So it wouldn't apply to things that happen outside of the school setting. Uh, and then again, it's it would be up to that student and that family in their plan um, whether a CDI was the best uh, tool for them to do well in school. So it depends. Certainly. The question seems to be more about um, a student who uh, is fluent in American Sign Language because they live in the dorms during the school year. Um, and so when they leave the academy and go to the public school system in Faribault, if they're using a hearing interpreter and not thriving with that, would this bill allow for a CDI to be brought in as part of the team in that situation, even though the student is part of the state academy system? So it wouldn't matter whether it was at the academy or even in Fairbo at the academy, um, because as Reagan mentioned, there are situations uh, sometimes where deaf students come in with different language um, of languages of origin that are signed languages. So they also might need a deaf interpreter in the deaf classroom. And then we're going to bring up Regan um, for her final question. I am so excited. So pardon me for jumping ahead. Um, what was my question? Now I've forgotten it. Ah, uh, crap, I forgot. Uh, oh yeah, why are we here this evening? Because has this bill already been laid or not yet? Are we waiting to get more support for this bill? Is that the reason? Also, I do have some added comments and just wanna say that dorms don't have anything to do with academics in the classroom. Honestly, some students might be really great at something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're skilled with English. So it doesn't have the same impact with an ASL monolingual in the school setting. It requires bilingual skills in academic settings. And so those two things are not related, dorm life versus academics. And so the question is whether a CDI could come in in any setting as needed. And so it's not meaning that interpreters are stupid. I know that we have someone who maybe already has a master's degree, but they weren't able to become <clears throat> they're so focused in a certain area that we wanted to be sure that we're destigmatizing deaf interpreters and Deaf people who need CDIs are not stupid. Sometimes, so we do need to just stop thinking that deaf interpreters, that CDIs are lesser than. We need to certainly destigmatize them. And really, in the dorms, there might be some connection, but not a lot. I just wanted to add that. When I saw this, this statement, I was very concerned because of misconceptions and it just reinforces negative stigmas already. So thank you. Great. So Regan, your question was, um, has this been lobbied yet? And are we here for support? Representative Beckerfin? Yeah, so I think this is also like a helpful time to sort of explain where bills come from. And a lot of bills come from advocacy organizations. They come from lobbying groups. They come from business associations. Uh, this bill was a bill that literally came from a family reaching out to me asking for help. And so it hasn't been lobbied in the sense that there's nobody being paid um, to make this bill reality. It has been me working with the family uh, one of the things we are hopeful about, so where we're at uh, currently in the legislative process, is that the bill has passed all the committees it needs to pass in the House, but it has not received a hearing in the Senate. And our hope in scheduling this and doing this event and also recording it and making it available for other legislators and other people is to really pick up some steam and raise up this issue um, so that we can hopefully get the Senate to hear the bill 
if the bills move in both bodies, there's a much better chance that we'll find agreement by the end of the legislative session. Uh, one thing that um, is important to note is that there is a, uh, what we, a fiscal cost, there's a fiscal note uh, to this bill because it would cost extra money um, to have a CDI team. And so it probably won't be resolved until there's a final budget bill uh, in the education sphere. The good thing is that the fiscal note for this bill is, although $200,000 is a lot to us, um, in the grand scheme of what we spend in our education budget as a state, it's a relatively small amount. So I'm very hopeful that if we get some momentum in the Senate that we will get this done this year. Thank you, Representative Beckerfin. Uh, I see one hand up. Unfortunately, we are about out of time. Um, we do have other questions in the queue as well. Um, so feel free to reach out. You can email me, Alicia Lane Outlaw. Jessalyn, if you could put my email in the chat, that would be great. Uh, but yes, feel free to reach out to me and we will try to answer your question in future sessions um, or just respond to your questions individually. We're very excited about the progress that this bill has made. And there was just an article about the bill uh, last week. So if you look at the session dailies, you will find that there's an article about this bill that was published last week. And so I may be incorrect, but um, after this is finished, I believe you will receive a survey to fill out. I believe that's true. So if you receive a, a request for an evaluation, please do fill it out so that we can make changes and, and serve you better. Uh, Representative Becker Finn, do you have any final words that you'd like to share with us before we close? I uh, just want to thank all of you and uh, thank the Nathanson family and everyone who has worked on this bill. It has been a long time coming and I, um, I have all my fingers crossed uh, that hopefully this is the year we can get this done. Um, it's not probably going to impact that many students, but for the students it does impact, it will make a huge difference. And I think it's the least we can do so that our students who are deaf uh, can thrive in the classroom. Well, thank you. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us here this evening. I know that you're busy with the legislative session, so it means a lot to us that you were able to join us. And we're looking forward to continue to work with you on this bill. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening and I hope you all have a good night. Thanks.